Hey everyone, it's Judy. Today you're gonna enjoy learning about something that affects every PCB designer, painful part shortages. You'll hear from John Watson of Legrand, who manages 50 designers globally. He's gonna talk about what's driving these shortages. Why is this season of shortages and allocations so different than ones of the past? When are, can we expect this to end? Best of all, he'll help you to navigate and give you some tips for how to succeed during this challenging time. So grab a cup of coffee, lean in, enjoy, and I'll see you on the other side. Welcome to All Team's On Track Podcast, where we talk to leaders about PCB design, tackling subjects ranging from schematic capture all the way to the manufacturing floor. I'm your host, Judy Warner. Please listen in every week and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and all your favorite podcast apps. And be sure to check out the show notes at altium.com forward slash podcast, where you can find great resources and multiple ways to connect with us on social media. John, welcome back. Thank you. We're glad to have you back. So it's, it's a pleasure to be back with you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. So for those of you that uh, may have missed it, John and I did a podcast some time ago, and I will put the link in the show notes for you, in which we talked about PLM and, and library management, one of my favorite ever. There's some funny things in that, so I encourage you to go watch that. But I wanted to bring John in today because he helped me actually write up an article recently in the On Track newsletter talking about sort of all the ins and outs of the part shortages, which yeah. are a nightmare. And I asked him just, you know, thought he would send me a nice few paragraphs and off we'd go. And he sent me like, I don't know. A <laughs> I think it was 3,000 words. <laughs> It was, it, it, it was, I it think was, it was very, around there. It yeah. was very thorough, but it was really good. Yeah. So, and people reacted um, really positively to it. So I thought, well, we need to do this. Oh, absolutely. In the podcast too. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to, you know, pull on your good graces yet again. So no problem. So <laughs> why don't you start out by sort of giving our audience an overview of of your perspective of part shortages and which ones are particularly hard to get right now? Yeah, um, I, I think this this whole problem's been hitting us for about a year now. Um, I know it's hit my company personally pretty hard. And I think it's hit most of everybody else's companies really hard for about a year. And about the last six months has really been ramped up a lot. So um, a lot of the, the the shortages were first caused by capacitors, and right. specifically the L L MLCCs, capacitor, and it kind of started there. And that's where the that's where the brush fire started. <laughs> that's <laughs> where we refer to it. Um, and uh, you know, to kind of give a phrase that everyone can probably relate to, it, if you know, this is DEFCON one at this point. It, it is a crisis that's hitting our industry mm -hmm. and uh, a major crisis, I might add. Um, it, it's, it's now this brush fire is now kind of crossed over to other areas and other product lines and different parts and different things like that. But it all started with the capacitor area, basically. And uh, that, that had several reasons. And we're gonna guess we're gonna Yeah, go we are gonna those. dig yeah. into that because shortage on capacitors. Yeah. Like what world who, are we living in? Who would have who would have thunk it, right? Don't um, we are not in Kansas. I don't know. I know. It was like capacitors. Yeah, exactly. The uh, there's MLCC uh, multi-layer capacitors. Um, there's three trillion that are produced every single year, and you would never think that that would be what's hit the the popcorn industry. Basically, the, the what is common, what is mostly used, and what is common, and it's, it's that little fly in the ointment, though, that has really caused major problems for us because now the popcorn stuff is hard to get. Right. And when that happens, now we got major problems. So we've really had to kind of take a step back and reevaluate things and change things and do a lot of different things, which, I, which I'm looking forward to talking about here. And, uh, but it, it has been a major problem. And... You know, I, I told a story, I'll, I'll start with this. I told a story at Altium Live this year, and uh, 
when I was talking about this very subject, and I was uh, telling them about a story. Uh, I was a volunteer at a Boy Scout camp several years ago, and I, um, you know, one of the last few days that we were there, we we decided to do something special for the kids. We we set up a water slide. Uh huh. You know, we s put some straw down on this hill, and we put a piece of plastic down, and uh, you know, we took a hose to the top and ran the water down, and all that. And you know, it's in the you know the guys were going, "Hey, John, test it out." <laughs> okay, all right, fine. So I went down the water slide, and and wouldn't you know it, I hit every single rock on the way down. <laughs> all right. <laughs> It was just unbelievable. So I went to a friend of mine who was actually working in the infirmary that, that, at that time, and I said, look, look, I, I really messed my back up, and I, I need you to clean it up. Sure, no problem. So he, he kind of worked on me and everything else, and uh, you know, it, was, it was like nothing, no thought about it, right? It was no, no worries. So and I went home a couple of days later, and I take my shirt off, and my wife looks at it and goes, what is that? <laughs> oh, nothing to worry about. I explained to her the story and everything that happened. And, and she goes, no, that. Well, what this gentleman had done while he was cleaning me up was that he left a message on my back. <laughs> um, basically, in iodine, he wrote, I love you. <laughs> All right. So I didn't just have to explain to my wife why I had scratches on my back. <laughs> Uh, which was bad enough, but why I had a message that said, I love you, you know, and... How this relates to car shortage, <laughs> well, I can't is, wait <laughs> to get to this point. The, the, <laughs> the, the moral of the story is this. Number one is never trust your friend with iodine and Q-tips, um, <laughs> number one. Number two is you cannot prepare for something that you don't know exists and that you don't know about. <laughs> and so I, think, I think that... This is an area of the parse shortages have now gone so big that it has now impacted almost every company I've, I've spoken to and right. every person I've spoken to. They are aware of this problem, mm -hmm. and uh, it is a major problem. So what particular parts? So you said it started with capacitors. So yeah. how is the wire, wildfire spread? What other parts are We are We are seeing now shortages in the board sensor uh, parts. We're seeing uh, shortages in MOSFETs. We're seeing even shortages now crossing over to the resistor area. Uh, Denver transistor packages are now uh, being things that, and there's various reasons, because what has happened is it's been a domino effect as, as this has go taken a, happened, that the, even the areas that were not affected have now been uh, affected uh, for hmm. several reasons. So. So, well, let's jump in right there. So what's driving it and yeah. what's driving this kind of, you know, fan out thing where it's affecting all these other parts? Right. Um, basically, there's three main industries right now that are driving this whole, it, what it comes down to is this part shortage is, these part shortages are being caused by supply and demand. Makes all sense. Right? And it's a basic economic principle. Right. And the demand now has outweighed the, the supply so heavily that it is just so counterbalanced that it's unbelievable. So they can't catch up, in They can't words. catch up. Uh, no matter how fast these companies who are producing these components are producing them, what has happened is they just cannot keep up with the demand. Mm -hmm. Now, these, the demand is coming from, I see, three main industries. Okay. Number one, the IoT industry. Uh, Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. Everybody now has it a, a, a smart device. Yep. All right. A smartphone, a smart, uh, a smart refrigerator, a smart toaster, which now a hooks up to you. Dog bowl. S a smart <laughs> dog bowl that tells you that your dog is now run out of water. Yeah. You know, and all these different things. It's estimated that they're going to be putting in twenty new billion. That's with a B. 20 billion new IoT devices yeah. in the next few years into the market. Which you've heard this number, I've been hearing this number anyways here at Altium, but you, you would have thought they were, there would have been some kind of preemptive yeah. planning. Right, exactly. You would think, and, okay. And maybe they did, and maybe it's outstripped the planning, who knows. Right. 
I, I think that's what's happened is the demand got so uh, s such a high a high amount that they just did not weren't prepared for it. So uh, you know now you have the smart devices. You have um, actually my company I work for is involved in IoT industry. Right. So. Um, my my big question is what what's going to happen when the I/O you know all these smart devices start communicating with one another, <laughs> you know? Uh, let let me give you an example. You know what happens when your smart refrigerator starts communicating with your scale, <laughs> you know? And you try to put on a, a dozen donuts onto your shopping list, and you're you know it would be like a repeat scene from 2020 Space Odyssey. I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that. You know? <laughs> Uh, I've been communicating, and I've been talking to the scale, and we've decided to put you on a diet, <laughs> you know? What? Or so, your refrigerator door won't open. Like. Right, exactly. I mean, we're, <laughs> so what happens when IoT basically takes control and it takes over? But 20 billion new devices yeah, it's, in, in the next few, and, it's, and that, it's I, I, will, I will add, is a 100% increase from where we're at right now. 100% increase in just a few years. Right. So that's the first industry. The second industry is the mobile phone. Mm -hmm. uh, there's estimated that they're going to be producing 1.5 trillion mobile phones in, this, in the next year. The, in each phone, there's an estimated 1,000 capacitors. Wow. A, a thousand. thousand. A thousand capacitors, okay, in each phone. Wow. So if, you, if we follow the math here, Follow, carry the zero, carry over. And remember, we said that we, we basically we have three trillion capacitors to work with in our supply. Right. Half of those have already been allocated over to the mobile phone industry. So half of them are already now gone, gone spoken. Gone. Yeah. All right. So that's the second industry that's really hit. Um, I'm going to. Are more people getting mobile phones? Why are those? I like, think so. It must be that maybe. I don't know. Why are we getting more phones? That, that would be a good. I think huh. it's. Just, I think it's more. I will investigate that. If I find something good on Google, I'll put it in the show yes. notes. Like there must be more people getting yeah. phones. Let's reminisce for a few minutes, just between you and okay. me. Okay. All know? right. Remember the olden days when there was this thing called the landline. Yes, the landline. Yeah, the landline. And, and if you if it was really classy, you'd get the long curly Q cord, exactly. so you could walk all the way from the kitchen to the right. dining room. That was the so that you was could the, talk right. in the next room. Then after like three calls, it all got tangled up and just spun up anyway. So yeah, it, <laughs> those were the days, weren't they? No one has landlines anymore. No, I don't. I don't. I, I don't have a landline. I, don't I have a mobile. Why? I don't. So everybody's now connected to their mobile phone. Just go down to the mall and just, just sit at the food court and watch people. Uh, everyone's like this, you know. So, yeah. Uh, it's, it's amazing. But yes, you want to see, want to know why there's going to be 1.5 trillion new phones? Well, that's why. And uh, I don't see that slowing down. I just don't. The third industry that's really impacting this part shortage is the car industry, the mm -hmm. automotive. Mm -hmm. And this is a brand new kind of field of science or field of uh, engineering that people are now getting into is this whole automotive area. And um, it is, it's not just the fully self-driving cars or anything like that. It's, it's the crossover technologies, such like as- the hybrid? The, not, just the hi not just the hybrid, but the <clears throat> technologies that are now being pulled over into conventional gas engine cars. Right. The, you know, the automatic parking, the special things, right. the bells and whistles mm -hmm. and all this and mm -hmm. that, the electronics and all the, mm -hmm. you know, things like this and that. Um, you know, it's crossed over to those things also, but there is now expected a huge increase of electric cars, hybrid cars, all mm -hmm. these different vehicles. And it is actually said that there's like three to f two to 3,000 capacitors in a conventional vehicle. Now, in a f fully electric vehicle, there's 22,000 capacitors wow. estimated. So you figure the influx of, the, of everybody, all the Priuses out there, which I, I find really interesting. I mean, they're so quiet. 
The Priuses, right. the Priuses are unbelievably quiet. Right. I, I think that it ought to be a law that if anybody's driving a Prius, they need to hang their head out of the, the, the window and at least make a, an engine sound. <laughs> okay, that, that should be required. So you didn't get run over on yeah, the right. Prius. Yeah, right. So at least you know you're there. <laughs> all right. But um, all these vehicles are, are taking 22,000 capacitors. Okay. Now, that is kind of a, an unusual situation also because you have an entire industry now that has kind of flourished in the just a mm -hmm. short period of time. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, you have a standard, it's a very harsh environment. Oh yeah, with all, all right. the heat and yeah. The heat and the vibration. You know, and the vibrations and the different things. So what has happened is they've actually now created an entire standard board, standardization organization around this. It's called the AEC, mm -hmm. Automotive Electronic uh, Council that is now placing out their standards that are going to be required for components. Oh, okay. So all these tests and requirements for heat, temperature, humidity, and all these different parameters, now all these components have to be tested under those, those, per, those sets. Oh. Okay, so what has happened is I understand that almost 50% of those components have fallen out, have failed test based on that standard. Oh, wow. So that has now caused the industry to just go and hyperdrive, all right? Um, so, okay, so let me get this straight about this new, so, you know, we've lived off largely IPC standards. Yeah. So automotive has developed these new standards yeah. that are more rigorous because of the harsh environment. Right. And half of the components that they test fall off the spec. Fall out, fall out from test anyway. So they now have to double their supply to just get what they need to to have their for the manufacturing. So that okay. Is, so they're losing them via destruction. Are they also simultaneously actually making them more, you know, hardening them so yeah. to speak? I think of like radiation hardening, but yeah. you know, hardening them for the automotive environment. Right. They're trying to meet that standard now. Uh, and so there is the additional requirements of manufacturing, different, different steps they need to take. So that's, wow. been, that's been strictly on the supply and demand side. That's, that's all that... That's wild. That's all that's impacting the supply and demand. Now, on the manufacturing side, what has happened is that they have... There has been such a knee-jerk, that's the only way I can describe it, is a knee-jerk reaction uh -huh. to this. Uh -huh. Is that they have, basically, these manufacturing companies now have looked and they said, well, you know, people are not using the larger size capacitors anymore, which we're not. They're less, they, they sell less. Of right. That. So what they've done is they've actually now started deprecating and obsoleting those parts. At the same time that... Right. And converting those lines over to the new, more popular sizes. Okay. So this is how now also impacted the whole industry because now if you were in using your 805 capacitor... In, an, uh, in a what legacy design that you wanted yes, to keep going. So exactly. now you have to re-spin it? We have to possibly re-spin it. All right. Oh, uh, now you have the situation where these manufacturers have shut down entire lines so they can convert them over to the more popular sizes. All right. S usually which are the smaller ones. Mm -hmm. All right. Right. And the other pr the problem is, is now the vendors have now had their knee-jerk reaction and what they've done is they've now gone over to what's called allocation. Right. All right. So they say, well, you know, um, Mr. Company A over here who only buys a thousand parts a, a year. Well, we, we appreciate your business, but we have another company that's buying a million. So what has happened is the big companies have gone first dibs on parts. And what they've done is they've taken the small ration of components that are available and they've kind of said, okay, you get, let's see, you get, and you get some, and you get some, all right? And what, they, what these vendors have done is they've now set up guidelines that said, well, the, you can only buy parts from us. And this is an actual guideline that they've, they put out was that said, 
you can only buy parts from us if you have been with us for at least the past year. Okay, so if you're a new customer, we're not taking any new customers, and you have to have been with us for at least a year to buy components from us. Wow. That's been on the vendor side. That's crazy. All right? So that's been the knee-jerk reactions that have occurred all throughout this right. whole thing. And what happens is, basically, these the few components that are out there gets allocated and dibbed out to the, the companies that are the big companies that get first in line, and it just continues. Now, what has happened is the the companies who need these parts, once they get into allocation, oh, that's a sweet place to be, all right? Now what they say, well, you know, I need this many components, but I know there's a shortage, and I know that these are really valuable, and so now well, what they're doing is they're tripling and, double, they're doubling oh, so and tripling they're their orders, all right, and they're stockpiling them. Oh, jeez. Okay. So I, I can just imagine some some procurement guy out there who was, who's bought triple the amount of capacitors, you know, hoarding them in it's his like buying, hoarding them in this cellar somewhere. Drugs. Then, you know, going around going, They're mine, they're all mine. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I, I just but this whole thing has just been a new jerk reaction that has occurred from the industry over to the manufacturers, over to the vendors, over to the over to back to the manufacturers uh, of the product, the OEMs. So this has just been a snowball thing, and that's why I refer to it as a brush fire. That's you know, this is sounds like a forest fire by it's, now. This is this is now a forest fire. This right? is a full-blown forest a, fire. It's a brush fire that's turned into a blazing exactly. fire. Exactly. Okay, so based on the data, which I'm sure you're looking at from vendors and from manufacturers, and that yeah. It, When's the forest fire going to dissipate or go out or be 50% contained or? Um, we hope, I hope by the end, maybe by the end of 2019, I'm seeing some good numbers. Things have started to, to reduce down on, on lead times. We were seeing lead times, just kind of give you some numbers. Uh, we were seeing lead times for our short, our, our short lead times. This is our short ones, mm -hmm. 16 weeks. What? All right, that's a short lead time. A medium, up to 32 weeks. All right, now you're out there nine months somewhere. Mm -hmm. The long lead times, up to 80 weeks for components. Meaning, if you that's ordered crazy. a part today, <clears throat> mm -hmm. you would not get it till June of 2020. All right? Now, I don't know of many companies, but I know I, I know my, my company cannot operate that way. Well, what what I was just thinking about when you said that is, LeGrand is a fairly good sized company. We're pretty Wonder good. if you're a startup. Oh yeah. And you haven't been buying for the last year. Right, exactly. I mean, it just seems like a, a death sentence. You're like, out of luck. You're just out of luck. It's it, it just, um, you know, it's, it's a situation where it's, you can't, you can't get into that you can't get into the club, basically. You know, you're you're outside and you're trying to get in, and um, so we have base. I I see it improving now. Maybe by the end of the year, because what's happened now is the supply has caught up with the demand a little bit, mm -hmm. um, especially in those the capacitor areas. And but yeah, it's still going to be rough. It's still going to be where it's not something you can depend on. You know, it's wild. So, you and I've been around this industry for a while. There's yeah. been part shortages in the past. Yeah. We've gone on allocation in the past, mm -hmm. but it seems like a ninety or one hundred and twenty day thing, and right. it, and then they ramp up, and then we're out of it. Right. What What makes this one so different? I, I think this one is different because I, I remember, for example, in two thousand, there was the part shortages for electrolytic capacitors. Mm hmm. A lot of that was driven by certain uh, parameters in the market or parameters in the environment, meaning that there was a actual material shortage. Oh, okay. okay. Like raw materials. Raw material shortage. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit of that now regarding tan tantalite, which is a, a product, a, the ore that's used for tantalum capacitors. There's mm -hmm. a little bit of that. But what is different now 
on this this one is that it's the it's a dr market driven shortage. I see. So um, it is where it's not can't be pointed to where it's a specific right uh, shortage of materials and different things like that, mm -hmm. which is just it's much easier to solve here. It's it's more of an emotional shortage, meaning that this has now taken on a life of its own where it's it's kind of because like you said people are getting fearful and maybe hoarding right. more than they need exactly it's like you know way back in the whatever it was 70s we had the gas shortage yeah and people are storing drums of gas in <laughs> right. their closets yeah, exactly. or whatever so but now they're doing always that with a good always a good thought to store <laughs> gasoline in your closet uh not recommended not Please. recommended not recommended few house fires over that yes one. yes uh, so i mean that's probably what's different. And the, the other thing is the time that this one's been going on. Um, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's so extended. Uh, Before it, we would get into it, be a little hysterical, but we knew. Right. We knew the way out. Yes. We saw the way out. Yeah. And here it was just where the market compounded onto itself and it was the reaction to it. And that's probably the major differences I've seen between this and other part shortages that we've had. Well, it'll be interesting to watch because, yeah. as you said, the um, forecast for IoT devices is going up. We oh, yeah. we we haven't even got started. I right. mean, in exactly. some ways, so which is which is great news for us. It is. It's, I mean, this is fantastic news for us. Right. I mean, if you're developing IoT devices, hey, all right, you know. <laughs> Hope you have enough coffee for this great engineering right. effort that you're going to be having. Right. Uh, that's a lot of hardware. Yeah, it is. You know, and um, I haven't even, uh, there is actually a fourth area that is, is, is now just coming online, which I see is going to be the next big thing, hmm. and that's broadband satellite. Um, oh, okay. Oh, yes, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. We're, they're, SpaceX just got several new contracts to put up low low flying satellites, basically, to make everybody wireless. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. this is a this is huge. This is a lot of hardware out there, and this is going to be where it's talk about density. I, uh, I've actually yeah. seen. I, I was on the front end. I was actually working with SpaceX, mm -hmm. and these boards were massive oh yeah and the number of components mm -hmm. per single board per satellite yeah. was astounding yes so I I can't even imagine what the numbers per right and then they've got to launch thousands or thousands of them, them interlinked to, to give, yeah uh, but this means there would be no mobile no uh, wired services of any kind it would all everything would be wireless could you imagine getting wi-fi everywhere anywhere oh, would we'd be, all dig that right like yeah, on be planes great. on the ground yeah. whatever that would be fantastic but, but there's the, the great news is is that our industries always revolve is is evolving evolving right i mean it's always doing that and it's in it, innovative and i i love that about this industry mm -hmm. is that Actually, I'm very glad that we're not where we were 20 years ago. Right. When you think about it. All right. Just look at the mobile phone alone. Uh, for those, uh, I'm basically aging myself now, but it used to be called the brick. It was like it a was big, the big brick. thing that was like a big walkie talkie. Oh, Joe, you know, hey, uh, yeah, we, we got you. We got you over there. Yeah. Yeah. I <laughs> kid you like, not. I got like tennis elbow for yeah. being a salesperson and carrying around those big brick phones. Yeah. And I only like talking on this ear. <laughs> and I got like bursitis or tennis elbow from oh, really? carrying this giant driving with the brick. Right. <laughs> the, the so brick, yeah. yeah, I'm dating myself there too. Right. But no, we're glad we're not there. We're glad right. it technology is, is moving forward. So we, we forward. are glad that we are evolving. But uh, these new industries are having a huge impact though. I see that. So how are you at Legrand? You manage around, I think you told me, 50 designers or so. Yeah. How are you managing this? You have a lot of products, a lot of yeah. different things, and probably some legacy products. I'm sure you are in the throes of this on many different levels. So, right. so can you share with our listeners like some helpful workarounds, some things you have figured out? Yeah. Uh, hacks. We need some hacks, John. <laughs> we need some comp component shortage hacks. Um, well, first off, 
uh, I would recommend, if you're in the throes of this problem right now, is not to bury your head in the sand and say, everything is just fine. Uh, everything is just, it's, it's just going to be great. It's okay. Uh, this is not a time to, for positiveness, <laughs> okay, to be positive. <laughs> Don't I mean, be optimistic. We're at DEF CON 1. This is a problem, and it's got to be solved, okay? So um, I believe that, first off, you've got, you've got to, what I, what I tell our designers is that you've got to prepare, be prepared. Uh, make, make design based on the fact that you're going to have this problem up in the forefront. So one of the things that we have now really done is we've been proactive regarding this. We've been prepared and proactive. And one of the ways that we've done that is, number one is, we have, uh, we have designed out of the norm. Meaning? Meaning that um, we have looked at what has been the common line design uh, guidelines. Right. And we've stepped out of them. Meaning this, if you have an IC on a board, and you're going to attach a bypass capacitor to that PCB and that component, you're going to use a 0.1 microfarad capacitor of some value or some mm -hmm. size um, at some tolerance, for example. So the first thing that we do is, can we change the value of that? Does it need to be a 0.1? OK. And then the next thing is, can we change any of the other parameters involved that is the norm that most people are going right. with? Right. So we say, okay, 0.1 microfarad at a 1%, all right, well, does it need to be a 1%? No, it can go up to 5%. Okay. I find that a lot of times designers, they over-design their product. Right. They over-design it and they go, yes, this has to have a 1%, you know, capacitor in it. You know, right. I said, and I, I remind them that, you know, is this a device that requires such a high standard? Right. Is this a is this a, a medical mm -hmm. device, for mm -hmm. example, or is this a military device that requires such a stringent guideline? Okay. If not, then we, we what we do is we start adjusting our values, we start adjusting our tolerances, especially mm -hmm. other parameters that we, you can look at is the uh, temperature ratings and different things like that. So what we start doing is we we start getting out of that that normal path of design. Sort of thinking out of the box, yep. looking where you can sort of fudge right. here and there, but exactly. still stay within the performance needs that you need. Sure, right. Right, but yeah. But so what we're doing is make that, no assumptions. Yes, make no assumptions. Um, and what we say, well, look, there's now a bigger supply of parts for 5%. Now, the other thing is that we've had to do is we've had to be proactive regarding this this problem. It's not going to go away anytime soon. Right. We have to be proactive. The normal, the normal path that we normally took in our design process was that we designed, we built the boards, we took it over to an assembler, and the assembler would then look at it and they say, oh, by the way, we can't get this part. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. It's, it's on order, or it's this or that. Right. All right. That, that was the old way. Now what we're doing is in courtesy of this company in um, courtesy of this company that started in Australia named Altium that <laughs> they have this tool called active bomb mm -hmm. and what we've done is we've now actually started as soon as that schematic is done we we take that schematic and we run it into the active bomb and we immediately get red flags of what components are not recommended for des designs or not recommended for the, the to to move forward. So we also get those po components that are obsolete because a lot of times what So you're checking it at the schematic level before yeah. you start laying out. Yes. So that's oh, yes. being very proactive. I, right. I see what you're saying. Okay. Very proactive. Uh huh. And then we can go back to the double E or the person responsible and say, look, that's not recommended. And I've actually had a couple of engineers go, well, don't, don't worry about it. It will work itself out. No way. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, it's no, no. We 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 have gotten into the situation where uh, we actually placed parts. I tell you, it it was so bad. And this is a story that it was so bad that we actually placed an order for a part for parts mm -hmm. before we could cut the PO. A few minutes later, the parts had already disappeared on us. So wow. 
one of the things that we are trying to do is be proactive <coughs> at the very front. And one of those, the major tool that we're now using to do that is ActiveBomb. And we're running that schematic right through ActiveBomb. We're getting our red flags and we're saying, okay, these are, these are going to be our problem mm -hmm. children right here. Okay, so if you don't have ActiveBomb, yeah. you should have it. But besides yes, that, <laughs> absolutely. If you don't besides have ActiveBomb, that, get ActiveBomb. You can use things like Octopart, which is Octopart? available to everybody, right? right? Or is there yes. other services? There are other services, um, uh, but uh, that you Octo can run that check through, right? And right. Have Octopart is very good. They all they also have a bomb check that you can take your your uh, bomb through and you just drop okay. it in and it just checks it for you. Okay. But before, really what this is, uh, what, what has happened with Active Bomb is it has caused us to kind of restructure our communication. Before it was procurement, never talked to the engineering. Right. All right. Now engineering is talking to procurement and saying, oh, by the way, you're going to have problems with these parts. Wow. You know? So we're actually pushing over to them the problem children and saying, oh, by the way, uh, you're going to have problems with those. Well, we don't have, we don't see anything on the radar yet. Well, believe me, you're going to have problems with them. And, uh, you know, and we actually So run you're them. actually helping purchasing to be proactive too, to like snatch exactly. up those parts that might become problem children right. later. So we, we are actually, we, we, we've pushed that information over. So we're actually being proactive over to them also. Right, which actually helps them to be more successful. Yes, exactly. It makes right? everybody successful where everybody makes more money. <laughs> you know? um, Unicorns and rainbows, but, that's lovely. Uh, I guess I guess the other <clears throat> thing is that we, we've actually placed on to several designs um, multiple footprints to handle a 805, a 603, a 402, oh, uh -huh. and, and all the way down. So okay. we, we've done a little bit of that as far as multiple footprints to accommodate various part sizes. So um, kind of broadens the supply of, of right. available parts available uh -huh. you know, to us. Right. Um, some of the other guidelines that we followed is that we do not have single sourcing for a part. Mm -hmm. not, uh, we have multiple sourcing for a, sing uh, for a component mm -hmm. so that we're not tying ourselves into a single, right. a single group or right. single person. Uh -huh. uh, so, that has been basically the our plan of attack with this. So, what are some resources you might be able to share to like stay on top of this? Because this is obviously changing, you know, day by day or month yeah. by month. And so, what are some resources that you sort of tap into and that you might recommend to our listeners to tap into? Yeah. Um, you know, besides the obvious ones like the DigiKeys or wherever you may be sourcing your parts, is right. there other there places are, you would? There are constantly put out uh, reports that are, are out there that are available usually on a monthly, quarterly basis of part availability, the industry. And this is not usually an area where PCB designer gets into. Mm -hmm. I mean, he says, hey, let me do my schematic and lay it down on the board. You know, it's just... <laughs> You know, they, they don't get into like the part side. They just say, well, that's, that's that guy's problem. Problem, right. You know? And so there are a lot of resources available for part reports, different things like that. Keep, it, keep aware of, the, of those reports and what they're saying. They're actually put out that quarterly amount of what their supply has been, what their demand is. And see those numbers. Look at those numbers and say, "Oh, you know, it's it's getting better. It's getting worse. It's uh, you know, it's this uh -huh. or that." Um, keep aware of the issues out there, and there's a lot of resources that you can look into. I mean, just search um, on on part availability and reports and different things like that. Um, Octopart is very good. Also, um, the um, there's also, Texas Instruments is also a very good resource of uh, supply, component supplies and sourcing information. Mm -hmm. They seem to, to work a lot on that side. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, we will share those links in our yes, resources and our show notes. So, we'll give you all we can, all we can rustle up. So, yeah. whew, I'm tired just listening to you. <laughs> like, it sounds exhausting. <laughs> This process that you're having to go through, as if yeah. as if design, you know, didn't have its own share of um, challenges. You know, yeah. let's just 
you but know. I, I will say, you guys almost nailed it perfectly with the active bomb tool that you put out with the Ultium 18. It was it was almost perfectly timed for this crisis. Yeah, who knew? Well, so uh, I, it, it was like maybe, uh, you know, I don't think you caused it. But, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, but you know, you know, but it it was definitely a, a it has been the go to tool for us. Well, that's because, great. It's um, good to hear. We well, I say who knew, but you know, one thing that I really appreciate about working at Altium is this relentless innovation thing that we're always forging ahead and seeing not only what needs to be addressed now, but what may be coming. Right. So, um, you know, kudos to our R and D team that Absolutely. that saw this as an area that was just could be sort of a time suck, really. Right. Um, whether you're in a part shortage or not, but like you mm -hmm. said, that it is, is, is I'm glad it's been a useful tool for you. It, it has been, and it's been a phenomenal um, setup because we actually now take some of our legacy designs, take it back through Active Bomb, and we get red flags and warnings for those parts. And we think, oh, so now we're looking at procurement for our legacy designs and different things like that. So it, and it, catching it before it's a problem. Right, exactly. Which so is it, really it's been lovely. A very, very good tool for good. us. Good. I'm glad. But you know, um, more on a personal note, and I, I think I've shared this with you before. I, you know, as a user of Altium, and working with you guys for as long as I have, you know, '98 since it was Protel, and I, I wanted to tell you, as as a user, as Tron would have said, I'm a user. <laughs> um, but as a user, I want to tell you how much we appreciate you guys and how much we appreciate what you do here. We um, are out there in the trenches you are of indeed. electronic design and trying to keep up with the innovations, trying to keep up with all the demands that hit us. The demands from management, the demands from our time schedules, the demands from our, our, our part shortage issues, and all these different problems and issues. And one of the things that has really been the go-to thing has been Altium. Mm. It has been the one that has given us the tools that we have needed to fix these issues and to fix the problems. And I don't think you hear it enough. I, I want to tell you as a user, and for now, as a representative of the PCB <laughs> design community, I wanted to say thank you Aww, for what you guys you. do here. It is, it is a phenomenal thing, and uh, we appreciate what you do. And we just wanted to let you know that. Thank you, okay? John. Thank you. I will make sure to pass on, especially Absolutely. to our R&D folks who sometimes all they hear is, you didn't fix my one bug. <laughs> You know, so we yeah. are glad that we are, our intent is to enable you to do good work. So Absolutely. thank you for your kind words. So, um, well, thank you. Thank when you. In closing, I wanted to say to our audience that um, Altium Designer 19 was recently released. It is available for download now if you're an Altium user. If not, come on over and have a test drive and, and see all the good things that John's talked about today. So thank you again for joining. We love being part of your lives and we appreciate you listening. Please subscribe, comment, let us know who you'd like to hear from or what you'd like to hear about. Uh, we're only as good as, as you letting us know what you'd like to hear. So thanks again for joining and remember to always stay on track.